First off, uh, I'd like to, Babs and I both would like to wish all of you a very happy holiday. Uh, and uh, certainly a better New Year than the pen we've had. <laughs> so uh, greetings to you all. Uh, a little bit of history on what this is about. In 2006, I discovered yesterday, uh, the Moravian Church, Northern Province, offered a trip to Israel for its members, and Babs and I went, uh, along with a number of other members of our congregation and uh, other congregations in the uh, Northern Province. Uh, so the, the trip had a religious bent to it, but I had a lot of interest in the archaeological and, and the uh, geographical parts of it. So uh, I figured, we figured that uh, after our pastor, Doug Kleintop, gathered all the pictures together uh, and put on a presentation that lasted forever with over 200 slides <laughs> uh, to the congregation that I'd like to do something like that for Kiwanis, but uh, <clears throat> not 200 and some slides. Uh, the, um, Doug very graciously provided me with all of his slides and I picked out the ones that I liked, some of them which we took and some of them he took and the other members of our congregation took. So anyway, that's where we uh, start. <clears throat> we'll get on to it. Just a little bit of statistics about Israel. It's uh, over 8,900 people, 8.9 million people. Uh, major to towns, Jerusalem, over 875,000. Tel Aviv, over 436. And Haifa is over 280. They're the three largest cities. We, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I upgraded some of these numbers from 2006 <laughs> because uh, those things do change. So I asked Wikipedia and they gave me some new numbers. The religion in, in uh, Israel, Judaism, about 80%. 80%. Islam or Muslim, 15%, and Christian, 2%. Official language is Hebrew, and Arabic and English are also uh, spoken. Uh, to give you an idea of our trip, we arrived in, let me get to, we arrived here at Tel Aviv. Uh, just to stop a second, you guys all seeing this? They're all muted. Yes. Okay. Wait, no, as long as you're seeing it. I got some head shakes. <laughs> we're, we're, we're seeing it. Good. We're seeing it. Uh, Tel Aviv is here on the Mediterranean. We arrived there. Uh, we went as far north as the Sea of Galilee up here on the top, uh, and all as far south as Masada, which is down here on the Dead Sea. Uh, to give you some perspective of size, uh, if Tel Aviv were Reading, Pennsylvania, it would be like going to uh, Strasbourg from Reading to get up here to the Sea of Galilee. And to get down here to Masada, it was like going to King of Prussia. That's distance. So there were no long trips. Um, OK. Oh, see, Sea of Galilee, getting back to where I was. The Sea of Galilee is not a sea. It's a lake. I keep, I'm not, get back here. Okay. It's a lake. It's a uh, freshwater lake. It's the lowest in the world. That means it's like 685 feet below sea level. That's up here. Uh, it is the second large lowest lake in the world. And guess where the first one is? Right down here. This is the Dead Sea. It's, it's not a freshwater lake, so it's, but it's a lake, and it's the lowest lake in the world. Um, let's see here. Jordan River flows actually through the Sea of Galilee on down the border of Jordan and into the Dead Sea. Uh, it's about Dead Sea is about 395 square miles in area and is about 1400 feet below sea level. That's like a quarter of a mile vertically. Now we can go to the next slide. 
Here's a picture of the Dome of the Rock. Uh, this is the same area. This is in Jerusalem, and the same area is is uh, sacred to three religions. The land in Israel was conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BC, conquered by the Babylonians in 587 BC. The Jews were freed from exile in Babylon in 538 BC. The Romans conquered Jerusalem in 63 BC. Arab domination began around 638 AD. In 1099, the Crusaders took Jerusalem. The Arabs and Christians fought over Jerusalem and Holy Land for 300 years. The Mamluks gained control in 1291. The Ottomans and Turkey took over in 1516. <laughs> Egypt took control in 1831. 1917, Palestine granted by the League of Nations to Britain with a mandate to build a national home for Jewish people. In 1947, the United Nations partitioned the land into Arab and Jewish states, but the Arabs didn't agree and war broke out. Wars in 1956, 67, 73, and 82, still unrest between them with each views as fault as the other. And this is why so many people say this land is mine. Areas of conflict right now, obviously, uh, uh, you got the Gaza Strip down here along the Mediterranean. You got the West Bank, which is here in the shaded area. And up here out of the picture is the Golan Heights, all of them we visited. We visited many sites, both from the Old and the New Testament. Some were in Israel-controlled land, and others, like Bethlehem, were in Palestinian-controlled lands. Okay, get from one side to the other, you're required to go through security checkpoints or go around the 25 foot wall. The Israelis are constructed, have constructed as the barrier to the Palestinians. Um, I don't know, maybe where that Trump got his idea. So after arriving in uh, Tel Aviv, uh, we drove to the first stop on at the ancient city of Caesarea. It was a port city, uh, let's see here, built around 28 BC, dedicated to the Roman Emperor Augustus Caesar. The ruins include a huge theater capable of seating about 4,000 spectators, still used for summer concerts. Uh, this is a picture of our pastor's wife, Rosemary, and my first wife, Babette, also my current wife. <laughs> uh, let's see here. And here is another picture of the ruins at Caesarea. The short way, way you see the site of Herod's, <laughs> one of Herod's palaces, the moat, now this is the palace and some of the excavations of it. Uh, the moat that surrounds the palaces was built by the, uh, uh, during the time of the Crusades. Okay, let me introduce our guide. His name is Zach. He's a Palestinian, but a biblical star, scholar. Excellent guide. Zach studied in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and met and married a girl from Nazareth, Pennsylvania. Uh, they moved to Bethlehem, Palestine, and that's where they live now. So Zach had a quite an interesting contest, contact with us. We were very pleased with his work. The building in the background, incidentally, uh, used to be a mosque, uh, which now being has been repurposed as a restaurant. Just a little further north, 
we came upon the ruins of uh, an aqueduct Romans built uh, during Herod's reign to bring water from the foothills about 11 miles away to Caesarea. Another picture of the, these Romans were quite the builders, I'll tell you. They didn't even have a backhoe. This sign gives you just a feel of the, the, the lines here are the sea level of the Mediterranean. Down here on the right is the sea of uh, the Lake of Galilee, <laughs> the Sea of Galilee. You can get a feel for the various elevations on that one. Okay, next stop was Tel Megiddo. The word Tel before location indicates it was uh, man-made was a man-made mountain. In other words, it was built on the ruins and other cities and they just kept building up. Uh, uh, located one fortress on top of another as it as time goes by. Megiddo is also known as Amagedon. More pictures of this. This is a town. Here's a model of the uh, uh, what they believe the, the, the latest fort that they were excavating was. And here's some of the pictures of the excavation. You can see this depth of excavations. That was, I think, a cistern or somebody's bathtub. You can see again the elevation difference here of the excavations that they're shown. And uh, here again, it is amazing how much they dug and discovered at McGinnis. This is a hole in the ground, actually, because down where they had a tunnel that goes to get water. And that was kind of weird because if you went down there, you had to go all these steps to get back, or you had to go outside and come back in through the main entrance again. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, Megiddo is also known as Amageddon, uh, mentioned in the book of Revelations as where the final battle between good and evil was fought. Another stop was Beth Shean. Beth Shean was a uh, ex architectural excavation in, in an urban environment. Uh, as you could cross the street from the entrance is an urban environment. Uh, let's see here. An amphitheater was built where people would have thrown to wild animals as punishment. That's where the lions got their food from the Christians, I guess. Uh, Nearby was an, it's another one of the, the uh, lion place, but then nearby is an amphitheater uh, for plays. And it's used, currently used, <laughs> or at least was back then when we were there. Masada, this is the most fascinating place I think I've ever been, one of the most fascinating. <laughs> Uh, Petra falls into that classification also to me. But Masada is uh, a very important site in the history of, of the Jewish nation. It's used as an example of, of the uh, intrepidity, the people of the Jewish people and how they were, well, you'll understand what I'm trying to say when I get to that part of the story here. It was another of the palaces built for uh, Herod. There's no indication at all that he ever spent a day there, but they built palaces just for fun. Masada is up here at the top of the picture. This is how you get there. I don't remember doing all those steps, but we must have done them because the bus parking was down at the bottom. Uh, it's not far from the Dead Sea, and, and you'll see that in a future slide. It was captured in 66 AD by the Jews. Is a model of what it 
presumably looked like this. I guess they developed from ruins and whatever information they could dig up. After the Romans had crushed the Jewish rebels in Jerusalem, Masada remained the last Jewish stronghold. About a thousand defenders were left in Masada and they uh, were besieged for over two years uh, by the Romans until uh, finally overtaken in AD 20, 73, excuse me. To prevent the, uh, there you can see the Dead Sea back here. To prevent the Jewish people from escaping, these will be pictures of, of the top of the mountain. The Romans built camps around the base of the mountain and uh, built a wall around the mountain. <laughs> You can see that in this next slide. This is the Roman camp at the base looked at down from the top of the mountain. Uh, okay. To make their attack, the Romans built a earthen wall of mound ramp to get to on the left here, which is where they could get into the mountaintop fortress without having to go through tiny tunnels where there was no way they could get past the thousand. It took about 13 months to construct that ramp. Actually, I have to, I guess, tell you that I, they may have reconstructed this ramp to uh, make a movie, which there is a, a feature film about Masada. There was a film, I remember hearing about it, never saw it. Okay, the defenders decided they would rather be dead than taken into slavery again. So lots were drawn. And these are the actual lots, which each, I guess each soldier drew the lots, each man, and these determine a order that they would to kill their own family, then they would, then one by one, they would kill each other until the last would fall on his own sword. When this was all done, it, for some reason, only one woman and two children had somehow survived. That's it's, it's a moving story, and, and they, uh, they were bringing people, during the time we were there, they were bringing people, uh, Jewish people, young kids, teenagers, to Israel, and, and taking them to Masada to know the story, to give them a feeling of their ethnic system, ethnicity. Uh, it was, you know, the, oh, it's just a moving story. Now I'll show you some biblical sites we visited. This is a uh, picture of old Nazareth. Uh, and some of it not quite so old. It's basically where uh, uh, some of the major sites are located. The Basilica of the Annunciation. This was built in 1969 over previous churches. The, under the Basilica includes the Cave of the Annunciation, where the angel told Mary that she was to become pregnant with Jesus, supposedly. Uh, this is in Bethlehem, the Basilica of the Nativity. At this site of the birthplace of Jesus, current church erected in 6th century. The door of humility. <laughs> Originally, there was a much larger door, but it was reduced in size during the 17th century to prevent the Muslims from riding their horses into the church on. The door is about four feet high, requiring all, all who enter to bend down in reverence. The grotto of the nativity lies again beneath 
the basilica. This is a mural depicting the birthplace and showing a representation of the site. Now the fields of Bethlehem are where the, where the shepherds heard the news completely built out with houses and whatnot, malls and the usual stuff. Uh, but shepherds still tend their flocks and live in tent villages. Alongside the road, you can see this. Jordan River, beautiful river. Kind of reminds me somewhat of the Bushkill. It flows from the Sea of Galilee to the Dead Sea. It's fresh water entirely below sea level, since both ends are out. Famous for baptism of Jesus and John the Baptist and still being used for that purpose. This basically is the baptism place. Here's some uh, people preparing to be baptized as we were there. I guess they go with immersion problem or problem, immersion method. In the Sea of Galilee. Yeah? Fishermen in Jesus' time fished the sea in boats, like the one, this was a covered boat, obviously, it, and it was basically dated to be about the time of Jesus. So these two pictures of this very old boat. Uh, there's a sign that we thought was interesting. It said, did, did, was this belong to Jesus and his disciples or to the fighters of a battle? Or the fishermen of the Sea of Galilee. The fishermen of the Sea of Galilee still fish, and this is what we saw in the sea, uh, with boats similar. During our tour, we also used a boat. We're on a boat like this one, where we basically sailed the Sea of Galilee. Uh, Okay, along the highway, the guide stopped the bus at an overlook and said, check this out. Amazing sight down in this gorge. You can see the uh, St. George's Monastery. First hollow out of a rock wall of a garage founded in 480 from a set of caves and destroyed in 614. Rebuilt during the Crusades and is still in use as a retreat for monks. Looks like a pretty nice place hanging on the wall. And then we get to Jerusalem. This is Jerusalem from, this one is Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. Uh, this is the Wailing Wall. The, uh, you can see maybe right in here, white people write, please to God, and they poke them in the cracks of the wall. And I'm not sure if that's where that comes from, but I've seen it in other cultures. I noticed that in Japan, at the shrine there, they actually hang pleas to their gods on trees, written on paper or whatever, parchment. Uh, notice they're all men. The women have their own place behind us as we're taking this picture. This is a stairway runs from up a hill to uh, Khalifa's house, which is where Jesus was taken after his arrest. Uh, 
we have it on good authority that he walked on those stairs. I guess that they were that old and that's where he lived. This is an interesting church. It's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Where Jesus was, well, I, I don't know why, why you say he was crucified there, but it's built on the area where he was supposedly crucified. Uh, he's shared now by the Roman Catholic Church, Greek Orthodox Church, Armenian, Coptic, Syrian, and Ethiopian communities. So this one building is shared by all those This is other pictures of that church and as different areas of the interior or for the different air, uh, uh, sharing communities. Quite ornate in some cases. Ah, okay, we visited the mountains at Quamran. I'm saying that right. Quamran, many caves there. You can see one, where did we go here? I think it might be one here. Uh, Quamran was where the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls were found. We also visited a ruins of a monastery where the scrolls were written, which is at the base of the mountains. The scrolls were first found in 1947 by a shepherd boy, uh, probably seeking refuge from a storm. Figures they were written uh, for the period from three. 100 BC to approximately 100 BC. This is one of the caves. Other scrolls were found in 11 caves in the same general area until the mid 1960s. Uh, parts of these uh, uh, scrolls are in the museum at Amman, Jordan. Uh, we managed to visit them at another trip. It's quite interesting to see that. Okay, here. And no trip to Israel is complete without a float in the Dead Sea. This is our, this was our pastor at the time, Douglas Kleintop. And this is your speaker and first wife. Interesting. It's very difficult to float here. The bottom is mud. It's just black mud, really unpleasant stuff. But people were buying that stuff to paste their face with it and all kinds of weird things. This, this supposedly the minerals in it, and there's lots of them, are beneficial. Uh, it's very hard just to put your feet down because you're floating so well. Matter of fact, Bad started to float away. I had to wade back in to get her, to keep her from floating away. Anyway, that's the talk. Uh, I will entertain questions, not necessarily will I have answers, but I will entertain questions. I'll, I'll stop your screen share. Thank you. Does that put me? I have a question. Go back to mine and then stop the screen share entirely. There you go. Thank you, Bill. And you I have, have a question. Mute yourself. Who is it? Uh, Bob Watson, who's yes. the second wife? <laughs> I said first and last. <laughs> he did qualify that, and I have it recorded. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. <laughs> the Masada. It was an amazing tour. It really was. Uh, they're still doing it. The Arabian Church is still running these tours occasionally with, for others that didn't get to go the first time. Watson, uh, this is Skip. Um, during the time that you were there, um, was there any concern for uh, any attacks or any any uh, disruption? No, not really. Uh, this trip, especially, uh, you could see young people walking around with rifles and in their in their Bermuda shorts and, and t-shirts and carrying their rifles. Every young man or and I don't know if the women at that point were required or not, but it was required to be in the military. And when they were not on duty, they also carried the rifles in case there was some fast-acting emergency. 
Uh, but no, we didn't. Uh, in, a pre in a subsequent trip, we were in uh, there and also in Jordan, and we had a guard on the bus with us who carried a, a rifle and so forth. Or a, actually, he carried a yeah automatic rifle. We didn't feel we didn't feel uh, in danger at all. Watson, did you think that having a Palestinian guide uh, gave you any different insights than you might have had uh, if you had had an Israeli guide? Actually, uh, Zach was a, a biblical study, so he knew, student I should say, he knew us, knew what we were. He did not give us any uh, arguments, or any arguing points to work on, uh, He and he did not take sides on any of the discussions that were going on even at that time. We couldn't have asked for a better guide. <laughs> yeah. I, I, will, I will comment uh, that Barb and I and a few others on this in chat today uh, did see our pastor Doug at the time with his 200 slides. And uh, it, was a, it was a great show, but it was a very long show. <laughs> Oh, Watson, um, you talked about Masada. Uh, yeah. I did see that movie. I don't recall when, or I believe it was on television, but I'm not sure. And I will say, I don't think I have ever had a movie have a more deep impact on me than that movie. Uh, it was a long worried. time ago. I've never forgotten it. And it just had such an impact on me. I've never forgotten the story. Bill, did you time that? <laughs> uh, no, well, I've not really. I, I started recording before you started, and I don't know what the recording time is. I was going to ask you, too. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, less than 45 minutes, yeah. How did you like the food the last time we were there? It was, like, incredible. Oh, James and I, he was going to ask the same thing. We think alike. But anyway, the last time we went, we we went we went to a restaurant and and there was so how many were there? Like twenty different things. Did you do that? Did you go and and uh, I mean like it was I mean having dinner there is really quite yeah we we didn't yeah we liked the food I mean that was good uh, we weren't really wild about falafel but other than that we. Were, we, uh, we enjoyed the food, but there were people in our group. And I mean, I was, there, was, there was little bowls of everything, and it was like, you know, they had yeah. the hummus, and they had, um, what else did they have? They had, like, salads, and everything. it was like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> A like, funny, funny, funny story, on another trip to Israel, business trip, I got a cup of coffee. So I put some sugar in it and I took the spoon and put it in and it wouldn't go down. <laughs> I pushed, I pushed, I pushed. Finally, somebody said, you know, you're supposed to push the screen down to separate the coffee grounds <laughs> from the coffee. Uh, I don't know if I ruined that particular screen or not, but that was kind of weird. <laughs> Something we're not used to here. Well, uh, uh, Watson, you're on for exactly a half an hour. I guess that was enough. That was very interesting. So, so where, where was your favorite place? Where did you find, did you find a certain, a particular spot that you felt much more spiritual or? Uh, I think, I think, uh, well, what I didn't even talk about was while we were in Jerusalem, we went to a garden with a tomb that Zach said could have been where they laid Christ to rest. And there was a, a round stone. I never could figure out how they said they rolled the stone away, but it was like a round disc stone rolled sideways on its rim away from the door. And, and that's how they closed it. Uh, in that tomb, uh, or in that garden, I should say, we had a communion service. Uh, on that particular day to, with our pastor leading and so forth. And that, that, that was 
quite uh, moving. Uh, they said also that it could have been where uh, the crucifixion actually took place. Primarily, they said, because you don't crucify somebody where nobody can see it. You'd put it where everybody sees it to get the message. Would have been alongside the road. Uh, Zach was upfront about that. He said, we don't know for sure about these places. Uh, but if you believe, that's what the important thing is. Uh, it doesn't have to be the place. If you believe it's the place where you believe it happened, this is the place. It's really a beautiful place. We've only been, I've only been to a limited area, but it's, it's gorgeous. And it's, it, it just, um, I loved walking the old city. Uh, it's, you met it's, some really nice people. A nice man, Babs and I had an afternoon off. We stayed at a hotel right outside the main East Gate, West Gate, I think, one of the gates. And we walked in one day just to see what, we were looking for a place to buy some souvenirs. It turns out it was a uh, Jewish holiday and most of the shops were closed. We we're kind of wandering around here. And some man said, uh, you know, can I help you people? We knew obviously that we were tourists. And we just told him what we wanted. He said, come with me. He said, he took us up to Via del Rosa to a shop near the top of the mountain. And it turns out it was his cousin or something at the shop. <laughs> uh, we uh, got our souvenirs and then we walked out. And he was with some friends chatting down there outside the gate, not the gate, but the uh, the shop and he said how do we get out of here now he said we go down here you know turn left that'll take you to the gate you come in it's terrific we wandered around did some more sightseeing and after the gate and we got out there and he said the guy told us the hotel was straight ahead and we got out in bed and said let's walk along the wall a bit see what's over here so we turned and started walking around the wall and this man the same one started yelling at us he said no no the hotel's over here and, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, at first I thought, well, yeah, okay, he wants to get us into his cousin's shop or he wants us to get a tip, none of that kind of stuff. Uh, in lots of places like Egypt, you couldn't move without having people trying to sell you something. Nobody did that here. Wow. Watson, I noticed in the pictures, nothing looks fertile. Uh, I'm sure they, they have fertile land, but nothing that I saw on your pictures showed anything where they would grow their own crops or anything. Well, they do. One of the problems, and this is a problem at the Death Sea, I, I did a little more research when I started writing this thing. The level in the Dead Sea has dropped. And this has exposed the land alongside of it to fresh water coming in from the, from the Jordan. And that has dissolved the minerals and caused sinkholes. So it's even dangerous to try to walk up to the edge of the water now. And the other issue is that because they are using water from the Jordan for, for agriculture, less is getting in there. Plus they are uh, taking salt, evaporating for salt from the Dead Sea, that their sea level in the Dead Sea was dropping. They, back in the last century, which isn't that long ago, they were looking at the possibility of bringing a pipeline from the Red Sea to bring water into the Dead Sea to maintain the water level. Uh, my thought about that was, yeah, but what if that pipeline gets something happens to it? And you can't shut it. Now you flood a good part of Israel from the Dead Sea. That didn't show up in any of the things I read about it. But the concern was that the chemical makeup of the Dead Sea was different than the chemical makeup in the, in the Red Sea. And it would create totally different environment around the Dead Sea. Uh, I think they, they dropped the idea, at least that there was no indication that they were building anything at this stage. Well, thank you so much for uh, such a great presentation, and it's so appropriate for this time of year.